I'm Monique Mullenkamp, Publicity Director at New World Library. I recently had the pleasure of sitting down with Mark Beckoff to talk about his new book, Rewilding Our Hearts. I hope you'll enjoy this interview. In Rewilding Our Hearts, you talk about acting from the inside out. Could you please explain that? Sure. Um, what I mean f by acting from the inside out in my new book is that we need to feel the presence of other animals inside of us, in our hearts, if you will. Human animal and non-human animal. And move from there. And then letting those feelings of compassion and empathy basically motivate different sorts of actions to make the world a better place for these individuals. And so a lot of people look at it as being personally transformative, that there's a spiritual component. Because I really mean reconnecting via rewilding, um, becoming re-enchanted with our magnificent world before we lose it. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's basically it. And, and I think what appeals to some people about the process of personally rewilding is, and the subtitle of the book is Building Pathways of Compassion and Coexistence, is that in conservation biology, the word rewilding really means building corridors, they call them, so that wildlife can have underpasses and overpasses and move without being um, hit by cars, you know, shot at, or being otherwise harassed by humans. The pathways of compassion and coexistence that we build within our bodies emanates from the feeling in our heart of compassion and empathy and sympathy for other animals and then using those feelings to act from within. And, th and that's, that's really what it's all about. It's a personal and transformative process. Mm -hmm. Building on that, it's very easy to get overwhelmed when facing our global crisis. So what steps would you recommend for personally rewilding our hearts? I talk about the, what I call the eight P's of rewilding, um, being proactive, positive, persistent, patient, passive, uh, passionate, practical, and powerful. And so what I like about that, it, what it helps me to do is being proactive means realizing that there's problems at hand that we each need to solve. And the nice thing about it as a personal journey is that I might be more interested in non-human animals and human animals. Someone might be more interested in habitats rather than the animals per se. Doesn't matter. It's really a big pie and you can slice it up any way you want. You find the aspects that you're passionate about and move from there. So proactive meaning we can't allow ourselves to continue to continue to live by putting out fires. So the problems are there and we need to come up with solutions proactively. Being positive, there's hope. I know sometimes people look at me and go, my goodness, how can you be so optimistic and hopeful? Well, I really am. Do I think we're going to be able to return the world to what it was one day by rewilding? No, I don't. I think that we can't do that but it doesn't mean that we can't keep dreams alive as we move into the future. So being positive is really important, persistent, finding out something about what you're passionate and pursuing it. And don't let others sidetrack you. So, you know, in my, my career, people will go, do you really think that dogs feel joy? Do you know dogs feel joy when they play or that they, elephants grieve the loss of family members? I know that. The science tells us, but I know that because I feel it. And so don't let people sidetrack you into these silly discussions that basically remove, for some people, the little time and energy they have to put into making the world a better place um, for human and non-human animals. Being patient is really important. Don't expect the gold star on your head at the end of each night. In fact, I am sure that the work that um, I do and many of my colleagues do we won't see the light of day on that for ages. So, you know, we don't really need to expect, um, you know, the gold star, if you will. Being peaceful, um, being nice to those with whom you disagree. It's, it's, it's really important. Talk with people, not to them or mm -hmm. at them. 
And at the end of the day, if you disagree, then you each move on. I think it's really a waste of time to try to convince one person who really is incorrigible and you're not going to really change them. Um, so that would be the way. And, you know, other little things that are important is that every individual counts. Most people in the world don't have the time and the energy to do things. I mean, in Western society, we're very, you know, a lot of us are very well taken care of and we have the time. So people who can do something need to do something. You don't have to found a movement. Um, you don't have to give a lot of money. You just need to do things that make you feel good and set a model for other people. I was really intrigued to learn about the Roots and Shoots program. And I understand you go into a local jail mm -hmm. and work with inmates. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been doing it for about 15 years as part of Jane Goodall's International Roots and Shoots program. Mm -hmm. Originally started for kids, but now it's expanded into senior citizen homes, assisted living homes, refugee camps. And so when I went to the jail to say, you know, I'd like to start a Roots and Shoots group, and I'd like to talk about animal behavior, they kind of said, well, they're all animals in there, they'll love it. And I said, no, the point I'm trying to make is that animals are predominantly peaceful, compassionate, and empathic. And I think we can learn a lot about ourselves from looking at the behavior of non-human animals. The program's been a remarkable success. I mean, people sometimes laugh, you know, they say, oh, you're rewilding the wild ones. Yeah, to some extent, but, you know, they do wonderful artwork. They write beautiful essays. I've published many of them. One of the students did a beautiful drawing of Fifi, who was, you know, arguably Jane Goodall's favorite female chimpanzee, and it won an award at an art contest. Mm -hmm. um, so what I get these guys to do is realize that even being confined to a jail, they can make a difference. So I publish their pictures, I publish their articles, I talk to kids. They're very passionate, even some of the real hardened prisoners, about saying to kids, you don't want to spend a minute in jail. And so it's, so once again, you know, it's, kind of getting back to the eight P's, finding things they're passionate about, mm -hmm. you know, being persistent, being infinitely patient. I mean, some of these guys are never going to be out of jail or prison. But so they're really being patient. And then knowing at some time they will get some feedback. That's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the other thing that's important about rewilding is we all need some positive feedback. So it may not be that immediate gold star on your head. Mm -hmm. But when I tell these guys, look, I just published a magazine article uh, with quotes from you. They're astounded. And they can't wait, some of them who have families, to call home mm -hmm. or letters to their folks. So the rewilding project in jail has been very successful. And it opens up, opens up, opens up their hearts. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've had many people, many, many prisoners say, you know, I'm, I'm, I... I was a very cold person, before whatever, maybe they were raised in a very abusive home. We don't really know all the details, but thinking about non-human animals and mm -hmm. thinking about their homes and also thinking about human animals, if you will, um, has really opened their hearts. Mm -hmm. Some have come to realize that the things they did weren't very nice. And so I always have thought about rewilding as part of their own personal rehabilitation. Because really, rewilding is a rehabilitation project for all of us, mm -hmm. me included. I mean, I spend my life trying to make the world a better place for other animals and their homes. Every day I realize I can do more. So I see rewilding as rehabilitation as well mm -hmm. and making us feel better. I mean, there's no doubt that m most people, I can't say all people, feel really good about doing positive things. So rewilding is part of that positive move. You talk about rewilding the future. What does that look like? Right, that's a great question. Um, to me, rewilding the future comes back to a lot of the activities of the Roots and Shoots programs I've worked with and other organizations as well. Um, I think of rewilding the future as rewilding education, weaving in what we might call humane education, looking at youngsters as ambassadors for the future. So 
I think of most educational systems are guilty, if you will, of unwilding kids who in some real heartful way are wild creatures. They love to engage in what I call wild play, spontaneous play, just go outside. So part of rewilding the future, and I think it's a huge part, would be changing educational systems. Letting kids get down and dirty, taking them on nature walks, letting them, I mean the little things, you know, you ask what can you do? Well, let them begin to appreciate squirrels. You know, people go, oh, it's just a squirrel. Well, squirrels are really interesting. An ant, a bird, a flower, a tree, um, a home, you know, for the, a bird, like a woodpecker hole in a tree. So when I work with kids, they'll say, oh, you know, some will say, oh, it's just a tree with a hole in it. And I'll say, well, that's where a woodpecker lives. Oh, really? They, they don't know. Mm -hmm. Or I'll say, you know, squirrels are really interesting. They play with one another and they have families. And they'll go, oh, oh, really? So part of, once again, rewilding the future would be not only rewilding adults, because we're all part of the future, but rewilding education and bringing in the humane component. The, the whole concept of humane education is huge now across the world. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by rewilding the future.